We all know that real estate has created more millionaires than any other industry on the planet. We also know that it has created a lot of heartache due to mismanagement, overborrowing, and just simple life events that happen to all of us. Welcome to the Cash Flow Pro Podcast. My name is Casey Brown, and I am your fearless leader. And although we might be bourbon sipping and at times foul mouth Southerners, we will always do our best to be honest, straightforward, and due diligent with all of the information we pass along to you. Welcome to the show. Hey there, and welcome to today's episode of Cash Flow Pro, your daily real estate investing podcast and YouTube channel. I'm here today with Brendan Chisholm of, oh, Brendan, I forgot, where are you from? It's somewhere down around Atlanta, right? No, I am from Stamford, Connecticut. Ah, why? Oh, Noonan, Georgia was where the first deal was. And I guess maybe I took that you were from down there from that entire discussion. Disregard that. He is from Connecticut and he is with BKC Holding LLC, which is a company that he started. And he's got some really, really good things to talk to us about today, specifically surrounding the idea of uh, I think we're going to talk about at least a little bit of off market and then some other stuff about how he has um, how he has acquired some of the properties that they now own. So, Brendan, I apologize about the location issue there, but how are you today, sir? I'm doing wonderful, Casey. How are you? Oh, man, we couldn't be better. Uh, like I told you earlier, my stepdad used to tell people when I was growing up, the kids aren't in jail and my wife hadn't left me. So life is good. good. So that is the way everything is, at least here in the Western Kentucky area. So how are things up there where you're at? Everything's going well. Uh, boys are healthy. Wife is wife is happy and it, just focusing on real estate. <laughs> Nobody's so. in jail. Nobody's and, in yeah, jail. Yeah. And- Awesome, man. That that's great. So, listen, Brendan. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Maybe your story. Um, obviously, at some point in your life, the idea of real estate um, had uh, had poked its head up. Now, I want to I want to preface all of this by saying um, I'm going to tell the audience that Brendan took a little bit of a different route into the syndication multifamily business than most of us. So again, I am with the majority in how I got into real estate investing and rentals and so on and so forth. So uh, Brendan took a little bit of a different path than the rest of us. And so I can't wait to hear more about that and and how that looked or how you at least were able to dissect that and determine that maybe this other path was a little bit better for you. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Thanks, Casey. And thank you once again for having me on, on the show. Um, it's an Absolutely. Honor, honor and a pleasure. Uh, so Brendan Chisholm, I'm originally from uh, Northeast Massachusetts, about 20 miles north of Boston. Grew up there for the first 18 years, then went to Syracuse University uh, to their business school there. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Really? Yes. Man, sorry, we got a cut. <laughs> That's fine. You're not a big fan <laughs> of two, three. I don't know, man. That whole orange thing, it just it. I guess it rings too close to the Tennessee deal. So anyway, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. <laughs> it's all good. All good. We'll let you stay, brother. We'll I let you stay. That. Yeah. No. Uh, uh, went to the business school there. Um, I did what I could to to pass and skate by and really just figure out a way to network and get down to. After graduation, moved down to New York City, uh, took an operations job with a, uh, a parcel company uh, in New York and worked there for nine months. And, you know, nine months after being hired, it was, you know, Lehman Brothers collapsing and the, the teeth of the Great Recession and companies restructuring. So I got my first taste of being laid off by a company. Um, sure. So that was a nice rude awakening. But, you know, being 22, 23 at the time, I thought, you know, that was pretty cool that I was being paid and you know, could party all I wanted and then move back home with my parents. <laughs> um, yeah. Took another job uh, at, at, in operations with a rental car company. And my whole mantra, the whole mantra that I was you know, provided growing up is you get your education, get a good job, you know, climb the corporate ladder type of thing. So that's what I tried to do. Uh, quickly ascended up uh, the ranks of their um, multiple promotions throughout the throughout my time there 
And then, you know, right around 2013, so five, six years after graduating from college, uh, was promoted to a director level position, you know, overseeing like the Great Lake region of uh, the rental car industry, uh, the re- rental car company. Had all intents and purposes to move back because my wife and I were doing long, well, my then girlfriend, uh, now wife, doing long distance relationships. She was still working in you know, the New England area, in the New York City area. And I was in, you know, just north of Detroit. Um, right before I took a job offer for, with another company, they laid me off. So you know, six years, wow. two, lay, two, two layoffs, and I really started getting bitter taste of trying to go up that corporate ladder uh, anymore. Um, however, uh, this isn't the shift that everybody expects. Uh, still thought it would be pretty cool to find another cool job uh, working in that Fortune 500 realm. Um Took another job with an auto manufacturer, and uh, from there, you know, did the same thing. Got a promotion pretty quickly, but uh, you know, it was exposed to you know, different. I, 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 what I'm trying to get at is, I wasn't trying to. I was trying to figure out ways to generate alternative income. At this, sure. I'm getting you know making a little bit more money. I, I'm, I'm living with my now wife, with that then girlfriend in in Hoboken, New Jersey. And still figuring out where can we put money into that's you know, at first the stock market and it went that way at first. I had a pretty long drive to where I was working from there. So 45 minutes each way and started getting into this thing called podcast. And I just got a little fed up just listening to fantasy sports all the time. <laughs> so yeah. I started turning yeah. over yeah. to um, you know, other means. And I, I was introduced to like bigger pockets and you know, this and that, uh, you know, okay, real estate's pretty cool. With the job with the auto manufacturer, I started going out to like car dealerships and talking to dealer principals and general managers. You know, where did, you know, if you weren't, if you didn't inherit the the dealership, where'd you make your money from? Every you know, Nine times out of 10, these guys made their money through real estate. And yep. I'm like, okay, how are you making your money through real estate? Is like commercial yeah, deals. Man. And yep. I'm like, oh, wow, this is pretty intriguing. This is pretty cool. So yep. I jumped into my first or I think this was my first or second RIA group, you know, real estate meetup group. And it was probably the second one because the guy there talked about multifamily, um, owning multifamily, buying multifamily, and had that the concept of you know, you're buying a business that is a tangible asset in real estate. And with my yep. experience in the corporate America, you just look at a balance sheet, figure out ways to make you know, make the business better. And there's tons of equity that you can make on it. So I was intrigued. And I'm like, okay, this might be this might be where I can go. So I took it as a means. You know, signed up for his class, figured out how to get the blocking and tackling down where you know, most people probably would have started buying, you know, the one unit, doing a fix and flip, trying to wholesale working up to two to four families. I didn't want to do that. I don't like HGTV. Yeah. I don't want to fix and flip. And I, th- you know, and I think there's other means to be able to squ- scale quicker. So took two, three years of just learning the fundamentals of real estate and just focusing on that. And that's where, you know, I, I to your point, I kind of just moved around the single family space and move str- straight into multifamily. You know, three years yeah. after taking that first class, we close on, you know, me and my partners close on our first deal. And you know, here we are ever since. Well, it's so, difficult. A lot of times I know with, at least it was with myself. And I assume that this is probably the same with, with the majority of people that, that, that single family tends to filter people out going up into the multifamily. And I say filter people out in the respect of like, um, a lot of people either stay in the single family space or they're like, man, this sucks. And they get out. Um, I I got a, I got an idea. There's probably, it's probably split pretty evenly between those two people that stay and continue to move around in the single family space. But, but the idea that, that, that somebody like yourself could see the, the scaling opportunity past where most of us make that stop. And we're like, Oh man, dude, the bank just keeps giving me money and I just keep buying. And, and as long as, you know, like, like you're buying single family residences. And of course, you know, I was never really had anything over the 
I'd say over the hundred thousand dollar mark, everything was hundred thousand dollars or below. Um, and, and eventually that business hit a ceiling where you only have so much time. You only have so much brain power. You only have so much of, of the, the non-tangible assets that are, that are things you possess. And, but man, that's great to be able to see that scalability over that hill and just say, man, let's, let's, and especially the fact that you could, I don't know if your partners were they kind of doing the same thing or had they been involved in the single family space? Had somebody warned you and said, man, listen, this sucks. Let's, <laughs> let's go on and move around. Um, and if they didn't even, that's even a, 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 a higher move that there was more than one person in the deal that could see the, I see the, I saw, I saw the forest time. through the trees. Um, yeah. you know, I, I really grasped like the, the passive income and by no means in what am I doing is passive, but with the ultimate goal of becoming passive, sure, I sure. love the idea of being able to work with business partners, not just in your general partnership group, but third party property management teams that do, they built their infrastructure to be able to operate day to day, due to day to day operations of a property. That's not my focus right now, but ultimately you know, getting there it was. And it's, you buy, you buy it to your point. You, I looked at the numbers, ran the numbers and where I'm from, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to buy it. And um, if you're buying you know, rentals in my, in you know, where I am located, it's C minus D plus class single families and i just don't want to deal with that stuff right now sure and that's the same it's the same where i'm at too um i don't know there's there's a little there's probably a few more c right um than c minus but man it's the same deal and it's not you know and that's the whole thing uh, that you don't want to get involved in it it becomes a it becomes a management thing right. really um, and you don't necessarily want to, because a lot of times, although the people are good people, uh, they, they tend to, maybe they, I don't know how to really say that, but you know, they, there's just, there's some, there's some challenges with paying rents. There's some challenges with, uh, then as from a management perspective, you're like changing light bulbs and, and the, uh, the, the sheer upkeep on some of these homes, just to give somebody a reasonable place to live. When I talk about like, you know, you don't want ceilings falling in. I mean, not, not for the fact that people don't want to live in it, but for the fact that it's health issues and so on and so forth. So there's just a, a laundry list of, of things. And I'm sure where you're located, C to C minus class stuff, single family rentals is, I mean, you're probably still talking big money. Yeah. It's, I mean, if you're getting a duplex or, you know, a, a triplex in some of these areas, you know, a triplex in a place that's, you know, an hour plus away from me is $200,000. And um, it, it's just, it's a lot of down, it's a lot of money. And there's really, everybody's looking for a burr and everybody's competing in the same space and everybody wants to be, everybody's read bigger pockets. Everybody's, everybody's yeah. educated on what they need to do. Um, so I just didn't think at this time, based off where I was and what my goals were, I, I, I thought my main, my, I knew my main focus needed to be in multifamily. It took me longer to get there. You know, I could have bought a couple places, but I think just having that singular focus as to staying in, this is my lane. This is what I'm going to excel at. Sure. Uh, sure. And that's what you know, helped me to get to where I am today. Cause you know, there's, if you're looking at the iceberg, there's a little bit of the iceberg on top that you're seeing, but you're not seeing, you know, the whole, everything, but sure. beneath it as to what I put in over that, the course of those three years to, to, hopefully make myself successful over the, the rest of my life. Yeah. At least set yourself up and yeah. then, and then to get started. But yeah, man, that's, that's great. So um, let's transition here just a little bit and let's talk about investor funds okay. and what, what did that look like? So, all right. So, so finding multifamily is the first feat here that we've, obviously that's the direction that, 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 that you went that a lot of us, um, didn't go. And that's the first feat. Now, the second feat is, is saying, okay, Hey, how do I pay for this stuff? And when you start saying, okay, what, at what point did syndication become like this, 
what point did the light bulb come on or what was what was the lay of the land like when you were like okay i got to figure out because obviously you go in and you go buy a 10 million dollar deal some people have the $2 million down, they buy it themselves, they move on. Most people don't. And that's so they go out and raise investor funds and not in. And, and with that being said, I don't know if it was a $10 million property or not, but at what point did you kind of start putting those pieces together? I got asked to join the general partnership for the first syndication that we joined. Uh, but we were, there were six, six guys, six general partners on the deal. Uh, it was a $2 okay. million dollar equity raise and, so it was a $10 million property, basically. Uh, it was 4.2. With a- oh, so y'all raised the equity to buy the property plus the repairs? Yeah, so we did We did a bridge to eight. We're doing a bridge to agency deal on that. Okay. Uh, so we got a bridge loan. Uh, I think it was like 65% LTC. And don't quote me on the exact numbers. I'd have to look those up. But you know, between 60 and 65%. So we're going in conservatively, plus we're uh, raising you know, working capital and you know, rainy day funds, all of this stuff. Um, sure. And similar to the deal that we're doing in Ocala uh, in Rock Hill. But, you know, we're raising a substantial amount of money to make sure we can close and be a little more conservative to uh, you know, have that you know, adjust the risk adjusted returns and limit the downside. But. Yeah, you, you do it for, you, you keep on studying about real estate. You tell people, you tell your parents, you tell your friends, you tell everybody, hey, I'm investing in real estate. There's there's a deal in, there's a deal in the pipeline. Are you are you ready to go? Yeah, you're walking around like my, my, my stuff don't stink. And you know, it comes to the end of the day. It's, oh man, I didn't raise that much money for it. Good thing there's other general partners on this deal that helped close it. But like all of us were you know, scouring our phone books every single day, calling everybody, hey, I got this deal. This is what we're offering. Are you interested? So you have those conversations and you you, yeah. you get the lay of the land and you become more, you grow yourself organically to be able to have conversations with people that yep. this is a safe alternative investment by diversifying a portion of your funds. We don't want you to put all of your money in here. We want to diversify it. You can keep your money into Bitcoin. You can keep your money into stocks, but you would take some of that. This is a good, this is a good yeah. inflation risk that we were trying to promote a year ago that we're promoting in, in, at the beginning of the year when we bought this deal and we'll be even able to promote it more. Look at, you know, you're essentially buying a tangible asset in the land a fixed rate bond that has higher upside and equity to it. So, yeah. yeah. Well, and that's what I was trying to tell people is, is that, you know, the soda company, your, your mutual fund owned stock in could go broke tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you're going to have some, you're going to have some tangible assets, manufacturers assets and some real estate and stuff involved. There's obviously a hard cost there, but with a, with a piece of real estate, you know, you, you should theoretically have insurance, obviously, on the, the asset that's right. actually there, but you always have the dirt. You, No matter how you look at it, the dirt is always there and can't be basically taken away. I mean, obviously, I guess could be become a, a, a victim of the city changing zoning or right. something like that, but... If the, nevertheless, I mean, it's you still have that, and it's it, it becomes a just an alternative asset. Right. And I actually had a guy this morning was like, "Well, what's the difference?" And and I and I don't. This is just kind of going off a little bit here off the cuff, but one of the things that we all the the the, the main question that I get, or one of the main questions that I always get, is, well, "What's the difference in this and a REIT or you know real estate investment trust?" And and I always say, you know, you're basically getting you're basically getting the re you're investing retail money right into a deal for with you. Then that retail money is getting you directly the retail return, not getting the REIT, the return. Then the REIT takes all of their stuff out. And then you kind of get what's left at the end of the day in stock value or dividends. And so it's, it's retail for retail instead of retail for some, watered down wholesale money comes back right. does that make sense yeah no it makes perfect sense and like if you and, look at it from if you invest in a REIT you, know, you invest in Simon property you invest in Starwood all of these you're going to get six to seven percent returns so that's yeah that's that's a good return you know, however yeah but 
You, you, but what about the upside? Yeah, there's no equity upside, and there's no tax efficiencies that you're able to create with this. That's right. You know, we're we're doing we're going in. We're doing cost exercise. We're doing bonus depreciation. So you know, you're looking. You're bringing in a hundred thousand dollars, and you have you could have potentially a negative K one. And you know, that is what creates it. And there's, you know, that is yeah. the wonders of being able to invest with these multifamily syndications. Um, and to your point, you have equity upside available to you. The best ones in the, the business are able to say, I will give you 6% and you'll be happy with it. You know, that's, that's where the Star Wars and the Simons come in. But like for people like you and me, Casey, we're, we're figuring out ways to carve our way up there and hopefully eventually be able to say, hey, you still want to invest in me? I can buy you know, tangible assets, yeah, you're maybe going to get to that six to 7%. But right now we're trying to educate our people to be able to say, if you continue to put money in with us, we're going to make the highest and best use out of it for this alternative asset and create tax efficiencies and create monthly or quarterly cash flow with profit upside. And at the same time, you know, I was talking, this is just, these conversations just continue to come the same direction. But the other day we were talking about the fact that you and I, as syndicators, we have to basically every time one of our clients takes moves forward one inch in our process, we have to remind them of the risks and mm -hmm. and we you know and the risks. Hey, there's risks. Hey, there's risks. Hey, nice to see you again today. There's risks, and then and and with the REITs and so on, they're they're able to just kind of you know they let the trading platforms or whatever right. put forward a. 87 page disclaimer and that counts as as their their risk disclosure or whatever and it's just like come on man i mean you know we're out here we're there's no difference in us competing for this same now that we're doing institutional quality kind of stuff there's you know we're what's the difference there's there's not one now again i i guess there's a little bit of of some risk in individual operators, I guess, if you will. But at the same time, it's, it's, there's, there's still no, there's still less risk to me, I think, especially with the potential for reward on the other side. Now, the, 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 some of these underwriting models that I've seen lately, some of that could beg to be different than what we're talking about. Right. But at the same time, you know, that's why I think, some of these people need to be researching a little deeper into maybe that's why they're 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 making us disclose risk so many different right. points. And there's risk involved with every asset, and as you continue to have conversations with LPs, you, you, the first group was like some of your friends are like, "Yeah, I'll just throw in twenty five thousand dollars." Now you're getting into like high net worth individuals that are sophisticated. They yeah. under they don't need to worry about the private placement memorandums that they're going through. They're like, "Brendan, yeah. I know there's risk involved with this asset." However. I've looked at your underwriting. It's conservative. You, you, there's a good business plan in place. I like it. If it, you know, my downside risk is, you know, an 8% IRR versus what we're promoting between like 12 and 16%. Okay. Yeah. That, and fine. you said you're just, just for context, you said your first deal was three years ahead of underwriting, correct? Because it was such a good deal. And then I've, I, obviously I'm sure a market shift has taken care of, has, has helped push that. Right. has been a little bit of a catalyst for that but at the same time that's what you said right right yeah we're 30 it, based off our last lease up we're 40 percent ahead of underwriting from where we were underwriting to in uh so we were we were underwriting to 975 uh hmm. in, in a, mar a sub market that's 30 miles outside of georgia it's renting for 1400 dollars but we're not going in putting lipstick on these deals. We're, you know, this isn't your your value add that everybody likes. That hey, you can put five thousand dollars in and you can capture X amount more. No, we're going in with, yeah. we're going in with twenty thousand plus dollars per unit and changing appliances, putting in all in one washer dryer, and completely repositioning the property to make it a more a better community well, for the people. One of the biggest dangers of this of of one of the biggest dangers i see on the other side of this wherever we're where, whatever part of the mountain you want to call us at right now um one of the biggest dangers that i see has been the a lot of people have have somehow gotten the line skewed between repositioning and value add mm -hmm. 
um, that line has got a little blurry for a lot of on a lot of different deals because people are like they're going in and 80 percent of their strategy is to raise the rents. 20 percent of their strategy is to add um, quality of life things to the asset. And so when you go in and 80 percent of your strategy is is to go from from a, from eight hundred dollars a month to twelve hundred dollars a month or or a thousand to twelve hundred dollars a month. Um, man, that's dangerous because that's to me that that's a piece of paper. That's like, that's not real goods that people are actually getting a, 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 a quality of life use from. Mm-hmm. And when, when you go in now, all of a sudden now, rather than you having happy tenants, well, you've got about uh, 25% of them that are pissed off every day because now their rent's gone up. Mm-hmm. So you take that 25% and let's just, let's push them. Let's, let's say they move out. Now you've got, you have to replace them, which is some cost involved. But then at the same time, now you're here and it's like, okay, what, what do you do when, when the, the economy shifts? Right. Rent's not and, always going to go up. Well, yeah. And it's, there's a heck of a lot easier for it. It's a heck of a lot easier for it to go down than it is up at the mm-hmm. same time. Right. I mean, it's, you know, you bump in there and you go up $400, $300, $200 a month and people may pay it now, but at the same time, um, the guy down the road, the, 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 that didn't necessarily underwrite to that, or, or maybe I, I, of course I'm assuming they're another syndicator or whatever, but they didn't underwrite to that model. They underwrote to a 70% quality of life shift. Now he has a pool and you don't, and his rent, he's able to come down a little easier on his rent, mm-hmm. man, they're going to jet. And that's, you just, you have to expect that. So I see that as one of the biggest dangers of some of these models. And so, but you're, but you're at a point with that first property you're talking about where you could, you could stand a 50% drawback and still be okay. Yeah, it's it, it, it still have really massive is, up. It's trusting your underwriter too, and you know our lead acquisition guys are you know they're top notch with what they're trying to do. Uh, one of them has a private equity background. He cut his teeth with you know, one of the, one of the large uh, REITs that we were just discussing, and you know, it's we could have bought a lot more deals by making the numbers you know, fudge the numbers and saying yeah we're going to achieve rent growth in ten percent year one, ten percent year two, ten percent year three to make the numbers work but you have a fiduciary responsibility to people once you start taking their money and you need to execute on your business plan and yeah. having a realistic business plan. And this is, you know, this is for both multifamily syndications as well as your day-to-day job. If you, if you don't have something, it, you're not going to be able to sleep at night. And yeah, well, there's going to come a point where you don't, right. Or you can't, <laughs> you might today, you might get that acquisition fee today, but right. you got a $4 million piece of property, you get a 1% acquisition fee on. Right. I mean, that's don't don't get me wrong. It's decent money, but 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 man, I mean, that's that's not going to go real far on those sleepless right. nights. And most of these, I'm not sure about how you guys do your model, but we're not we're not in this for a we're not fixing and flipping multi family yeah. syndications. We're we're going. And you almost have to get rid of that that. This is, you, you, you almost have to take that and take it out back and shoot it. Yeah, and this is not a two, we're not doing two to three year holds. We're doing a two to three year. Ex, we have two to three years worth of execution that we try to bring into 12 to 30 months. We find the deal, put 10 years, seven to 10 years worth of debt on it and let it cash flow and make it a great long term asset that, you know, yeah. you get you. We return your capital back to you at the, you know, a, a, a certain percentage back to you at the refi. And then with the way we would write our, do our under our, our underwriting is you know, we do a, a we do a European waterfall, which is um, you know, GP doesn't get their promote until you return eight percent IRR or seven percent IRR. So if it's year two, we need to return one hundred and sixteen thousand dollars of your capital before we get into the promote. We invest yeah. in the deals as well, so we, we, we are seeing that. But it, it's the it's back to the we need to have realistic business plans because we want to get to get to that promote. And well, you want everybody to make money in the deal. People to make money because yeah, the, because the cost of acquiring new investors to replace investors that are pissed off and left 
is far greater mm -hmm. than if you just give an extra 10 or 15% of what the gross money I mean, or the, the net money, pass it back out amongst the, I mean, I just, that to me, that's just, it's crazy that a lot of people will burn bridges that then they have to rebuild only with different people. Yeah. And it's just, it's nuts. Hi, this is Casey Brown, host of the Cashflow Pro podcast and YouTube channel. Have you been thinking about investing in real estate, but just don't know where to begin? I'd like to help by inviting you to check out our website at www.3000capital.com. There you will find an array of material that will help you learn all about real estate syndication. And while you're there, be sure to check out our free video series download titled, five must know keys to success in passive real estate investing. I'd also like to personally thank you for making Cashflow Pro part of your day. Now, back to the show. So, but listen, all right, Brendan, I've got a couple of questions that we ask every guest that comes on the show. Of course. And uh for the listeners, I know some of the 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 number talk can be a little um can be a little dry at times. Unfortunately, it's part of what we have to do as real estate syndicators. So if you're looking at getting into this space or you're looking at investing in this space, this is, although kind of um, mono, not real high drama, high entertainment, this is stuff that you have to know in order to make sure that you're, that you're following what we're trying to get what we're trying to teach you here so that you can make wise investments, make good investments. And I guarantee you, Brendan here has, has just told you a lot of, of secrets, especially with his stuff. And of course he has available investments as well. But anyway, all right. So Brendan, we have a couple of questions. We ask every guest that comes on the show. The first one is what is the best book that you've recently read or are currently reading? So I'm reading Ready, Fire, Aim by Michael Masterson right now. It is his, Michael Masterson is a business guru, who's built multiple multi-million dollar businesses. And his yeah. whole mantra in this book is get your boots on and start selling. It's figure start out, going, start man. going and yep. sell yourself. Yep. And I, I, I really, I'm about a hundred pages into it. And he's thinking about like what your optimum selling strategy is. And you and me, we sell limited partnerships in sound investments. And how can you that's build right. off that? That's, that's basic core of what we're doing. So no. Yep. Well, they always say, and then part of when I was starting my podcast, uh, I kept the, you know, I had a little bit of, of, um, what do they call that? Uh, imposter syndrome. And then you have a little bit of over analysis paralysis or whatever, you know, there's all kinds of different sayings, but, right. but the one thing that people kept saying is, or the one thing that kept ringing in my head that, I say people kept saying, I guess the people in my head kept saying, um, episode one is better than episode zero. Mm -hmm. And it's the same, it's the same take on that ready, fire, aim. And it wasn't until I was about 30 episodes deep where I was really like, okay, you start kind of, you start kind of finding your voice. You start kind of figuring out what people want and it's the same way what you're talking about, man. I mean, that's, but that's great. And that's exactly what you did. I mean, pretty much even before the book. Right. So I highly recommend mm -hmm. it. hundred pages in, I'll let you know how the other 300 pages are, but uh, it, it's something everybody should pick up. Awesome, man. That's great. Um, the uh, next question is, what is a dream vacation you have either taken or hope to take? Uh, my wife and I keep on saying we're going to go to Hawaii, but uh I think that's going on for our 10 year anniversary now. <laughs> cool, man. That's a good trip. But if you're in Connecticut, dude, I'm going to tell you that uh, I've heard a lot of people that have went over there from central time zone uh, and you're even an hour behind us uh, that, that the flights over there are long. They take forever to get there. And then when you get there, it's like you're on, you're almost in a different world basically because of the time zone shifts. Well, so the ultimate plan for the next, you know, over the next five years, we're having our five year anniversary this year. She, she will sure. be retired by the time she gets to, if she wants to for our 10 year anniversary and I'll be full time into this. Um, so yeah, well, that, that'd be great. This man. isn't going to be a boys one, be... one week, two week. This is bring the boys and, you know, spend, spend a month plus over there. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Now we're talking. Yeah. Now you're talking my language because that's what, uh, 
and hell man go over there and be digital nomads for a month and just just move around and shift around and see a lot of people make the mistake of going from central time zone over there for like a week even a week is like is is just no that's not that's not anything but yeah man you'll have an eight-year-old and a six-year-old in five years and and uh yeah don't forget what i told you about those after they turn four they turn into spawns (laughs) I'm just kidding. No, I, I, kids are great. I love mine. I always talk mess about them. And, um, but anyway, so, uh, Brandon, tell the uh, listeners if there's something that they've heard that resounded with them and they'd like to reach out to you or reach out to you, possibly talk to you about maybe even your next investment deal or check you out. How can they do that? Sure. You can find me on, uh, at my website, www.bkcholding.com. Um, uh, Best way to reach That's me, holding. holding. As my listeners are aware, I'm always looking for plurals and non plurals, but it's holding, holding. bkcholding.com. And you can reach me at brendan at bkcholding.com or you can call me at 978 835 9376. I'm part of selling is picking up the phone and talking to people. Right. I love to talk to people, I love the concept of these podcasts. I think what you're doing here is great, Casey, and educating everybody. and. Uh, yeah, we're, we're working tirelessly to find a deal, but the numbers need to work for us and the numbers need to work for our investors to have that risk adjusted return in a choppy, choppy, volatile market right now. Absolutely. All right. Well, Brendan, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Um, listeners, if you don't mind to leave a five star review, if you like what you've heard today and also hit that subscribe button because we are always grateful to our listeners on a daily basis. And again, Brendan, thank you so much. Thanks, Casey. Appreciate it. Cashflow Pro is hosted by Casey Brown, founder and CEO of 3000 Capital, a commercial real estate investment firm committed to providing its investors with ongoing cash flow and helping them build long-term wealth. If you enjoyed today's podcast, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you'll be notified about all our future episodes. You can find more information about us and our investment philosophy by clicking the link in the show notes below. Thanks for listening.